welcome back everyone and we'll have another talk by Jeremy the same Jeremy as two talks ago and he'll explain how to work with sets in lean okay so give me a second uh I know it looks like something towards the end of the file was corrupted, but we'll worry about that later. Okay, so um, um, so right now I'm here to tell you about uh, uh, using sets in Lean, um, and uh, so I am working with a uh, uh, file sets.lean that is uh, um, in the uh, LFTCM repository. Um, and so what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to try to limit myself to talking for about 20, 25 minutes. Uh, so I think there's, there's, there's maybe more in this file that, uh, you know, that I can get through and more than we'll have time to do in this session. But I'll talk for about 20, 25 minutes and then just let you, let you add it. Um, so the examples are taken from Mathematics and Lean. Um, so there's a lot and it's a, it's a subset of them. So there's a lot more information there. Um, but so when we talk about sets, uh, so certainly modern mathematics, you know, depends on talking about sets, functions, and relations. And uh, informally, we think of set theory as being the official foundation for that. Uh, things don't look all that different in type theory. The, the main difference is that where in set theory, you can talk about a set of any objects. Uh, in type theory, you're always talking about sets of objects of some particular type. So, you know, I tell my students that, you know, in set theory, you can talk about the set consisting of, you know, the number pi and the absolute value function on the reals and the Eiffel Tower, you know, that, that, that's a perfectly legitimate set. But when we work in type theory, we're talking about either a set of natural numbers or a set of functions or a set of points. So it's always a set of some objects. Um, so here I've, I've arranged things. So we've got uh, some generic type alpha. Uh, and we've got uh, three uh, variables, s, t, and u. They're all sets of elements of alpha. And there's an, uh, a particular uh, object x of type alpha. Um, and then the notation is, this is just says that s is a subset of t, x is an element of t, x is not an element of t. There's intersection, union, uh, empty set. Um, I guess I should have also put down the universal set. Let me put that in now. Um, and oh, let me open set. Um, so why am I having trouble here? Yeah, it should be set alpha. Uh, set alpha. Good, good, good. Okay, good. So this is the universal universal set of type alpha. So this is the set of all the elements of type alpha. Okay, um, and. Uh, Okay, so we'll see these things unfold in just a second. So this, in this example, we want to show that if S is a subset of T, then S intersect U is a subset of T intersect U. Um, and this is a, a, you know, a, good, a good session to do after the logic session because typically these things will just unfold to logic expressions. So in this first example, um, I'm replacing rewriting the definition of subset and intersection and subset in the hypothesis, okay? Uh, and then there's this funny, uh, there's this funny X in element of the set of A such that blah, 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 but de-simple simplify that. And so by expanding everything, we just see that you have a, a logic problem once again. So the hypothesis translates to saying that every X and S is an element of T. And uh, uh, you're trying to show that for every X, if X is an element of S and X is an element in U, then X is an element of T and uh, X is in U. So the end of the proof is just kind of pure logic. Here I've used R intros and exact, but you could use cases, you know, intro and cases and so on. Um, and what these lines do is they, they simply just sort of expand all the definitions. And what I wanna point out is that while expanding the definitions is useful for us to see what is involved in the problem, um, if you already know what is involved in the problem, you don't have to do it. So if I just comment out these lines, right? Oh, so now the subset hypothesis needs one less argument, but essentially the same, the same proof works, right? I, I'm sort of looking at this. So I know this is the, the, this is the same that for every X, if X is in 
S intersect U, then X is in T intersect U. So I want to intro the X. And then I know that X being an element of S intersect Q is sort of a compound statement. It says that X is in S and X is in U. And so you know, doing a cases on that will, will give me those hypotheses. What was uh, R intros again? So R intros is this recursive intros. So let me do it the, the, the old fashioned way. So you can read about this in uh, Patrick's tutorial or in Mathematics and Lean. This is the old fashioned way of doing it. This is what I showed you this morning. You introduce X, you introduce H, and then you, since H is the hypothesis that X is in S intersect U. So by definition, this expands to X is in S and X is in U, and then cases splits it apart. And basically the R intros magic is that it's just a convenient way of doing this all at once. Okay, so you can read about that more, and I think in, in Patrick's tutorial uh, as well as in Mathematics and Lean. Okay, but so anyhow, so this is a few examples of uh, 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 of uh, ways of proving this inclusion. Okay, uh, and there's another example here um, with so this is the statement that uh, S intersect T union U is contained in S intersect T union S intersect U. And so this is doing it sort of the old fashioned way or the simple way using just intros and cases and so on. So you see there's the proof. Uh, but here's kind of a slick power user uh, proof of the same thing um, uh, using R intros. Um, yeah, just using R intros. Okay. So again, I don't wanna take the time out now to discuss R intros because you could do it, I mean, this way. Um, but if you do have time to, to look at our intros in Mathematics and Lean or, or just read the documentation, you can just see why isn't coming up in the hover. What oh, does it's an alias for our intro. Uh, what does the vertical bar mean in this line? Yeah, so you can read about the documentation here and it'll tell you what the vertical uh, brace means. So because X in T union U, uh, that's translates to a disjunction. It says that X is in T or X is in U. And if you look at the, uh, the result of this R intros, is it actually split into two goals. And in the first goal, you have the assumption X is in T. And in the second one, you have X is in U. So R intro is really a magical tactic that it'll do multiple introductions, it'll do nested introductions, and it will also split things when, when needed. I see. Yeah, but again, it's a slick power user move. You can get by just as well just doing intros and cases and so on. Okay, um, but so in the file, there are some more examples of this for you to look at, uh, you know, and play around with. Uh, here is set difference. So uh, X being an element of S set minus T expands to S in S and X is not in T. And so here's, you know, sort of doing the proof using intros and, uh, 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 you know, expanding the and using split. Uh, so this conclusion, right? So once you do the introduction, you're trying to show that X is in S set minus T union U. Lean will expand that to X is in S and X is not in T union U. Um, and so the split tactic is appropriate to, to prove that. Right? So that's what's going on there. Um, so yeah, so this file has a number of examples of proving set inclusions. And then uh, I leave you to try a couple more on your own. So this is the reverse direction. This is the other direction of the, of the inclusion we had above. Okay, so when we go into the breakout rooms, that's one thing for you to play with. Um, but Jeremy, may yes. maybe, maybe also it, it's worth saying that all those proofs, they can be done automatically by Lean. I mean, all those things about the uh, intersections of union and, and stuff like that. Yeah. If you just intro finish, it would just. just yeah. So let's let's try that. So, are uh, yeah. so. Yeah. so, so yeah. So the the finish tactic is good for that. So if you like automation, also the simplifier. Can the simplifier do it? Yeah, so the simplifier can often do these. No, no but the simplifier may, may be calling the lemma, the very lemma you're proving. Uh, oh. Whereas the finish okay. tactic is, is not using it's the... It's for foolproof. Yeah. 
Yeah, so, so these are, um, most of the things in the file can be done uh, with Lean's automation, uh, but the goal is rather to get you used to thinking about um, uh, uh, working with set theoretic concepts in situations where the automation can't do it um, on its own. Okay. And it'll also get you uh, comfortable working with, it's more, more practice working with the logical operations. Um, okay. Um, so this is how you, so canonically, if you want to prove an inclusion, you want to show that every element of the left hand side is an element of the right hand side. And so the intro tactic will let X be arbitrary. Um, if you want to uh, prove two sets are equal, you want to show that for every element X, X is an element of one if and only if it's an element of the other. And the canonical way to do that in Lean is to use the extensionality tactic. So the statement that two sets are equal if and only if they have exactly the same elements uh, is known as extensionality or the principle of extensionality. Um, and the uh, extensionality tactic, it's, it is a more general tactic than, than this, but it works for sets in particular. And it just reduces the goal to um, exactly what I've shown you there. Okay, so that to show that the two sets are equal, you let X be arbitrary and you show that every element of the left-hand side is an element of the right-hand side. And again, beyond that, you're down to just kind of, now this is just logic. This is really the statement X is in S and X is in T, and you can just practice your logic skills. Okay. And so again, in the file, you know, there are a few examples there, and then there are some exercises for you to play around with. Okay. Um, now, uh, so, so what are sets, you know, where, where do they come from? Um, so the, the, the point I want to make now is that a set is really just a property in disguise. I mean, whenever you have the property of being even, you know, you can talk about the set of even numbers. Or conversely, if you have the set of even numbers, you can talk about the property of being an element of the set. So there is this kind of duality between sets and properties. Uh, and in fact, um, a set is defined to be just a property with, with a different notation. Okay, so Lean goes, does a pretty good job of going back and forth between uh, uh, thinking about sets as sets and thinking about them as properties. Um, but if you have a property and you want to turn it into a set, this is the notation to use. So this takes the property of being even and turns it into the set of even numbers. And if you look at what's going on here, if I do rewrite with the definition, um, it, uh, it just expands the definition, okay? And now extensionality reduces it to showing that, uh, 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 that everything that's uh, a member of the set of even numbers or a set of the, the odd numbers is in the set of in the universal set. And the simplifier tells you that that's just the same as showing that n is even or n is odd. And we can do that by just classically using the law of the excluded middle. And uh, so one thing to point out is uh, even if we don't expand the definitions or use the simplifier to rewrite, uh, no, I lied. So simp, uh, okay, I thought that, uh, oh, yeah, okay, I take it back. You, you still need a simplifier to get rid to, of to, this. To, right, yeah. yeah, right. So when you do this, this is the goal. This is really the goal that if n is even or n is odd, that that holds if and only if true. Being in the universal set is the same as true. Okay, so let's leave that there. So yeah, so this is, this is what these examples are showing that S intersect T is by definition, the set of X such that X is in S and X is in T. S, is in U, S union T is the set of X such that X is in S or X is in T. Um, the empty set is the set of X such that false, right? So it's, it's, it's empty, it's not true of anything. And the universal set is, is just everything, the set of X such that true. Okay. And uh, okay, so again, with these concepts, there's an exercise for you to try out. So, uh, uh, so this asks you to show that the set of numbers, so the set of prime numbers and the set intersected with a set of numbers greater than two uh, is contained in the set of odd numbers. Um, and here it, the, the goal is just to get you playing around with the set theoretic notions. Um, so there is a theorem in the library that says that uh, if you have a prime number, it's either equal to two 
or odd. So that will give you most of the mathematical content. Um, and you're just uh, um, um, left to, to work with the set theoretic notation. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, okay, so Lean also has built in notions of uh, index unions and index intersections. So here, um, um, uh, um, so A and B are functions from the natural. And so the way to think about this is that A is a function from the natural numbers to sets. So for example, A0 is a set and A1 is another set uh, and so on. So this is just kind of lean notation for thinking of A as being a sequence of sets indexed by the natural numbers. Um, and um, uh, uh, so here you have uh, unions. Okay, so you can talk about the union of all the AIs and, uh, right, and uh, here you have intersections. Um, and once again, so the simplifier will, so, okay, so to prove this identity, you need to show that every element of the left-hand side is an element of the right-hand side. Um, and uh, simplifying with the definition of what it means to be a membership, a member of an intersection and simplifying with what it means to be a member of uh, a union, um, uh, uh, you just get the logical expression. Okay, so you just get quantifiers and so on. Okay. Um, and uh, so here's another remark. So simp only, that calls the simplifier with only these rules, um, which is sort of a useful trick. And I think the reason I did it here is that uh, if you just call the simplifier outright, it just, uh, uh, well, no, okay, there's no harm. So in fact, here we could have just called the simplifier. Oh, I think it just did more. I think it just did more work. Um, yeah. Um, let's see if we call it. The proof no longer works. No longer works. Yeah, the proof no longer works. Yeah. Um, so let me just leave that example alone. But uh, um, so again, another message is when you're working with sets, you can always try calling a simplifier and see what it does to your goal. And it may well do something uh, useful and helpful. Okay, um, but again, so there's some examples of using indexed unions and intersections, and um, there's an exercise for you to do that. Um, okay, so before sending you to the breakout rooms, let me also mention, say something about uh, images and pre-images. Um, and so, okay, so here is a situation, I'm trying to set up uh, uh, an environment, we have a function between types alpha and beta. So f is a function from alpha to beta. You've two, got two objects s and t, which are sets of elements of alpha. You've got two elements u and b with sets of objects of beta. And a is a, is a sequence of sets indexed by elements of i, and b is a sequence of sets uh, indexed by elements of i. Okay, so let's see if some things that we can do. So this notation means um, uh, the forward image of S under F. Okay, it's supposed to uh, be kind of an ASCII rendering of the set theoretic notation for, for kind of a, a, a backwards quote. Um, and this is synonymous with the words image FS. So it's the image of S under the function F. And the definition is exactly what you see here. It's the set of y, such that for some x and s, f of x is equal to y. Okay, so that's a familiar set theoretic notion. Um, and there's also the pre-image. Okay, so if you, so f is a function from alpha to beta, uh, u is a set of elements of beta, uh, and this is what we would write as f inverse of u, uh, the pre-image of f of u, and the definition, it's the set of x such that f of x is in u. And um, so what this tells you is, you know, having a statement of the form X is in the image of uh, S under F is really an existential statement, right? So if you're trying to prove it, you're gonna use the use tactic. And if you're gonna try to use it, you're gonna use the cases tactic. Um, this tells you that if you've got a statement of the form X is in F inverse of U, well, that's really the same as just saying that FX is in U. So that's usually very nice. It's just a very simple statement. Okay. And so there are lots and lots of set identities. 
um, uh, you know, involving images and pre-images. And so in the file, I have sort of a long list of examples. Um, so here's, you know, here's one. Here's just showing that um, the, uh, 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 the pre-image of U intersect V is just the pre-image of U uh, intersected with the pre-image of V. And the remarkable thing is that when you simplify this, so this reduces to the statement that f of x is in u intersect v. Uh, and that in turn reduces to the statement that f of x is in u and f of x is in v. And miraculously, the right hand side does as well. So in this case, this is just you know p if and only if p. And so the reflexivity tactic will finish it off. Um, but here's one where it's a little bit more work. So forward images, remember, is an existential statement along these lines. So here you'll see that this amounts to uh, proving inclusion. So if you were to expand these definitions, you're dealing with existential quantifiers. Okay, and I think this is pretty much a good place to stop. So there's then a list of exercises. And, but I don't know, it, somehow at the end of the file, it looks like I don't know whether it's in, uh, just on my computer or it's broken in the repository, so I'll try to go after that. But it looks like something got broken about the file um, at the very end. Um, so I apologize for that. If it's a little bit broken, uh, 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 you might have to just delete something at the end and close it off. But anyhow, there are uh, uh, lots and lots of exercises uh, here for you to experiment with images, pre-images. Uh, yeah, so there are lots of identities. Um, so yeah, so go to it. So let's um, uh, uh, pause here, go to the breakout rooms, and then you can play around with sets. So Jeremy, can, can I ask one question? Sure. So uh, it seems to me that there's not, if you could, can go up to the definition of image of. Um, yeah. Right, so here you have f, it's a function from the type alpha to the type beta, right? So fs yeah. means that you have, applied f to the set s and you're getting some set in beta yeah it's that's the way to think about it it's it's the image right it's the image of f on s so there's not really such a thing like the codomain it seems like you don't specify first to define a function you you don't first specify the, the domain and the codomain then say the image is the subset of the codomain yeah so this this is a good point so in lean kind of a, a function on its own is always, it's a function between types, right? So I can have a function from the reals to the reals or a function from alpha to beta. If I wanna talk about the behavior of a function on a set, well, uh, underneath, it's always a function between types and then I can just restrict attention to the set. Um, again, we, we've seen that this has some kind of annoyances that, so for example, when we talk about division, you know, it's most convenient to have a function, uh, division as a function from the reals to the reals. So it takes two reals and returns a real number. You really only care about division on, you know, places where the second argument is non-zero. But again, the way lean works is that a function is always a function between types. And so typically what happens is, you know, you've got a function between types and maybe you only care about the values on certain sets but really the best way to model it is to, you know, declare the function as the function between the underlying types and then reason about the behavior on the sets that you care about. So in a sense, you know, the official domain of F is, uh, is alpha and the official codomain of F is beta. And if you really only care about the behavior on sets, you just have to model that um, explicitly with what you say. Right, okay, thank you very much. Okay, are there other, are there other questions before we break up?